In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for this wonderful opportunity you have given each one of us to be here in this class, to listen to your voice, to offer you our praises, to glorify your name, and most of all, Lord God, to be taught by the Holy Spirit. Today, once again, Lord, as you teach us, Spirit of God, make this teaching absolutely easy, simple, practical for us. Anoint my heart, my lips, my tongue, my vocal cords, nothing of me, everything of you. And as you teach us, Lord, make this teaching absolutely easy, practical. Give us understanding so that as we apply all that we are learning in our day-to-day -day life, we can live the victorious life that Jesus won for us. We thank you and we praise you, Father, in Jesus' name, amen. So my sisters and brothers, today's gospel is from Luke chapter 4, verses 16 to 30. Now before we go to the verse 16, let me just give you a background of what happens between Luke chapter 1 to verses 15. Jesus has been filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. In fact, he has been fasting for 40 days in the desert. And after his baptism, which took place at the River Jordan, where John the Baptist baptized Jesus, the Spirit of God led Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted for 40 days. And so for 40 days and 40 nights, Jesus doesn't eat anything. And at the end of the fast, Satan comes up and shows up there with three temptations for Jesus. And we have all seen those temptations in the past. He asked him to turn stones into bread. Then he asked him to go up, the, up, up a high temple and jump there. And, and he says that even angels will protect you. And then he tells him, he takes him up to the high mountain and shows him, you know, all the glory of, of, the, of the earth. And he says, if you worship me, I will give you all this. And in all the three temptations, Jesus comes out victorious. He always points to the word of God. He always says, it is written, and he disqualifies Satan, and Satan runs away. And after all these temptations of Jesus, Jesus comes back out of the wilderness into Galilee, full of power of the Holy Spirit. And now he goes about with that power, with that anointing of the Holy Spirit, preaching, teaching, and carrying out all the miracles, all the healings, all the signs and wonders. And after he has done all that, there is such an impact that he has created on in, in, the, in the land of Jerusalem, in the land of Israel, that now he comes back to his own home country, to his homeland of Nazareth. This was the place he was raised up with Mary and Joseph. And now that he has performed all these signs and miracles, people have heard about it. The news has spread around all about. He now comes back to Nazareth, not as that little boy not as that 30 year old man who left that place, but now under the influence, the anointing, the power of the Holy Spirit, having already started his ministry in, in, in Galilee. And so we pick up the gospel today in verse number 16, where Jesus is now in his hometown of Nazareth. So verse number 16. When he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. He stood up to read. Now here the word of God says, it was Jesus' custom to go to the synagogue on the Sabbath day. Now brothers and sisters, Jesus was God. And he did not have to be right with God just to go to, to the synagogue every, every Sabbath day and take part in the Sabbath celebration because he already had a relationship with God. And yet, Jesus went to the synagogue as per his customs every Sabbath day. It speaks a lot to, for us because when Jesus himself, who was God, did not have to go to the church, did not have to go to the synagogue in order to have a relationship, in order to do anything there, because he was God himself. But he did it to give us an example that we as Christians, we who follow him, need to meet together as, as the church. We need to meet together in fellowship. We need to share what the Lord is doing. And Jesus did not have to go to the synagogue to pray because he was God himself. 
He had a good relationship with his father. So what was the reason Jesus was going to the synagogue? The only reason Jesus was going to the synagogue was in order to share the word, in order to carry out healings, to carry out those signs and wonders. And if you read every incident where Jesus went into the synagogue, you will always find either he cast out some devils or he healed somebody. There was a woman who was bent for 18 long years in the book of Luke chapter 13. He raised her, he healed her of her, of her back problems, he healed her of her bent back. And there were so many other signs and wonders that he did on the Sabbath day in the, in the synagogue. So when Jesus went to the synagogue, he did not go in order to sort of pray or to do anything, but he came there to share the goodness of the Lord. And you know, my sisters and brothers, this is something you and I can also learn. If Jesus gave us an example being God to why he had to meet together as a community and as a family and as a church, you and I need to go to the church. You and I need to meet together. Like, for example, in this Bible class, it's not just a Bible class where, we, although it's a virtual class, we are not actually, you know, meeting each other. We are not shaking our hands. We are still fellowshipping with one another. But the important reason we are coming is, of course, to hear the word of God, but also to share what the Lord is doing in our life. Unless we are coming to a class to give something, unless we are coming to that place in order to share the goodness of the Lord, you know, my brothers and sisters, our entire coming will not be effective, will not be actually totally complete because it is always important for us to share the goodness of the Lord. And Jesus did that, although he did not have to come to the church. Jesus did not need to go to the synagogue to pray to his father. He had a relationship with his father, but the reason he came was only that he could share the goodness of the Lord and you and I can do the same. So brothers and sisters, when he comes to the synagogue, what does he do? He is given a scroll to read from the prophet Isaiah. Let's go to verse number 17 to see what happens when he goes to the synagogue. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written. The word of God says in verse 17, that when the scroll was given to Jesus, he opened the scroll, he stood up and he began to read and he found the place. He found the place where it was written about him. Can you imagine my sisters and brothers, like how you and I are able to take the Bible like this. This is a Bible. It's a beautifully printed Bible. It has got an index. You know, when you want to find Luke, you want to find Mark, you want to find John, you want to find Genesis, there is an index. You can turn the pages and you can actually go and locate that particular verse or that particular chapter. But during the time of Jesus, the word of God was written on scrolls and there was no such thing as chapters. You just had to read it. So for Jesus to find the place where it was written about him speaks a lot about Jesus. It speaks about that he had been familiar with scriptures. The word of God says, when he was young, Mary would sit with Jesus and teach him the scriptures. That is why at the age of 12, Jesus was able to have a debate. He was able to discuss. He was able to ask questions, even to those chief priests, those scribes in the temple with the, the time when he got lost. For a 12 year old boy to be asking questions on scriptures, speaks a lot about Jesus, speaks a lot about Mary, his mother. And you know, my sisters and brothers, on that particular day, when Jesus comes to his hometown of Nazareth, to be able to find the place where it is written about him, speaks a lot about how familiar Jesus was with scriptures, how familiar he was with what was written on the scrolls. Because if you're not familiar, you will just take out any scripture and you will read whatever comes to your mind or whatever is in front of you. But for Jesus to locate where and find the place actually tells us that Jesus was familiar with scriptures. He knew who he was because if he did not know who he was, on that particular day, he would not have been able to find that place. And you know, my sisters and brothers, you and I can also know our calling. 
when we go and study the scriptures, if we just open the scriptures, just day-to-day -day scriptures, just open up whatever comes along the way, or maybe even if we do daily scriptures, if that's what we are limiting ourselves, then surely we are not going to really find the place where God has called us in scriptures. And therefore, in order to find our calling, listen to this very carefully, in order to find our calling, we must go to scriptures and find the place where it is written about you and me. Because in each and every person's life, there is a scripture, there is a word that the Lord will speak to us and he will show us what is our calling. If we can find that place, how beautiful it is, my sisters and brothers. If we can find the place where God has chosen for us, then our life will become so beautiful because all that we need now will also be provided along with the calling. Please listen to this, my dear sisters and brothers. When we find the place which God has called us, it becomes God's responsibility to provide us with all the resources, to provide us with everything that we need in order to finish that mission, to complete our mission, to finish that assignment which he has put us on this earth. And most of the time, because we do not know what that assignment is, we go about life sweating, struggling, shouting, yelling, I mean, going through all sorts of troubles, then we have an easier way by actually going and studying scriptures and finding our place where it is written about you and me. And therefore, we must understand that unless we are going to study scriptures, unless we are going to invest time in our day in order to dwell and, and really reflect on what we are reading and how we can let the Holy Spirit show us where our calling is, we will never be able to fulfill the assignment that God has put us on this earth. So we go now to verse number 18 to see which was that place that Jesus was reading. Verse number 18. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free. Now here we read that Jesus was provided with the scroll of the prophet Isaiah. Now what was he reading? He was reading from Isaiah chapter 61, verses 1 and 2. So we have read from Luke's gospel, Luke chapter 4, verse 18. Let us see exactly the scripture that he was reading on that particular day when he was given the scroll of the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 61 verses 1 and 2. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, to proclaim, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and release to the prisoners to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Okay, Jesus read only up to this. He read it up to, to declare the year of the Lord's favor. Now listen to this, my dear sisters and brothers. Jesus was, the first thing that happened to Jesus was he received the anointing of the Holy Spirit. The word of God says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. That's exactly what Jesus said. And Jesus did not do anything unless he was anointed by the Holy Spirit. So Jesus was enabled to preach the word of God only after he received the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Listen to this, my sister brothers. Up till the year he was 20, 30 years old, you never read anything about Jesus' ministry. You never hear that he went out to preach. He was the same Jesus who after receiving the Holy Spirit at his baptism, the anointing of the Holy Spirit came and only then he went out to preach the good news. And the word of God says, after he received the anointing, he went into Galilee, he began to teach, he began to preach, he began to perform those healings and miracles, 
and without receiving the anointing of the Holy Spirit, he was not able to do anything. It was necessary for him to receive that anointing of the Holy Spirit. And that is why Daniel the prophet in Daniel chapter 9 verse 24 had prophesied that Jesus would receive the anointing of the Holy Spirit. What did Daniel say in Daniel chapter 9 verse 24? He said, he said, come on. Daniel chapter 9. Cha Daniel chapter 9 verse 24. He was talking about the anointing that would come upon Jesus and he would now be able to prophesy. He would be able to carry out because there would be certain amount of time that would pass before Jesus could do that particular work because that was the prophecy which would take place after a su sufficient amount of time. Let us read Daniel 9 24. 70 weeks are decreed for your people and your holy city to finish the transgression, to put an end to sin, and to atone for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal both vision and profit, and to anoint a most holy place. And to anoint a most holy place. Remember, my sisters and brothers, there had to be a time that had to pass by before the anointing would come upon the Messiah and he would carry out the work which God had entrusted him to do. And you know, my sisters and brothers, we must understand that Jesus was the sinless son of God. He did not come onto this earth just like Adam came or like everybody of us come. We come into this world dead because of that sin of Adam. But Jesus was born without the original sin because he was not born, born from Adam. He was born of the Holy Spirit. And the sin always passes through the man. The sin always passes through, the, through, through Adam. And, but in the case of Jesus, the sin could not pass through, through Jesus because now Jesus did not have an earthly father. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit and the womb of Mary was used in order for Jesus to, to sort of be born for those nine months. And so my brothers and sisters, Jesus who did not have any sin, did not begin his ministry until he received the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And therefore my brothers and sisters, we must understand the same. When we only receive the anointing of the Holy Spirit, only when we receive the new birth, and how do we receive the anointing of the Holy Spirit? How do we receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit? When we receive the new birth, when we become born again in our spirits, now our spirit is sealed with the Holy Spirit. Our spirit becomes the same as the spirit of Christ. And now that spirit, which is the same as Christ, is sealed with the Holy Spirit. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 13. And now the Holy Spirit comes and makes his home within us. That Holy Spirit is the one who's anointing us. He's the Holy Spirit is the one who's giving us all the wisdom, giving us all the understanding to go out and to preach the word of God. And therefore, when you find that the truth is not preached, even though people are sharing the word, there are sermons being preached, the word of God is being preached. If the truth is not being preached, but in fact, stories are being preached. If only, you know, entertainment is there during sermons. That, holy, that anointing is not of the Holy Spirit. That anointing of the Holy Spirit will always bring those who are sharing the word to preach the truth of God's word. And when the word of God is preached, the truth of the word of God is preached, at that place, the Holy Spirit always shows up. The Holy Spirit will always show up in a place where the truth of the word is preached. And that's the place where the Holy Spirit will perform signs and wonders. There'll be healings, there'll be miracles, there'll be all sorts of wonders taking place because that preaching, that anointing is of the Holy Spirit. And so my brothers and sisters, we must be able to recognize when the word is preached, when the truth is preached. Why? Because only the Holy Spirit anointing enables the preaching of the word. The disciples were with Jesus for three and a half years, but they were never allowed to preach the word of God. Jesus never gave the disciples to preach the word of God until Pentecost. And when the Pentecost day came, Peter preached the first sermon and 3,000 souls were added into the kingdom. Look at the impact 
that was created when Peter preached the first sermon under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. So my brothers and sisters, we must understand that it is under the anointing of the Holy Spirit that the word must be preached. And when the word is preached under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, there will be signs and wonders. There will be miracles taking place. There will be great testimonies that will be shared because that anointing will bring a change in the lives of people. Verse number 19. To proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Now, in the, in the case of verse number 19, it only talks about to declare a year of the Lord's favor. Now, if you read Isaiah chapter 61, verses 1 and 2, the verse 2 that we just read, Jesus did not read the verse 2 completely. Let us go again to Isaiah 61, verse number 1 and 2, and let us read the whole verse 1 and 2 and see what Jesus missed out in verse number 2. Isaiah 61, verses 1 and 2, let us read complete to see what Jesus did not read on that particular day. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and release to the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God. To declare a year of vengeance of our God. Can you imagine my sisters and brothers the Jesus actually avoided reading this line which talked about the vengeance of our God. And why did he do that? Please understand, my dear sisters and brothers, Jesus' first visit or first trip to the earth when he came as a little babe in Bethlehem was to set the people free. He had come in order to provide God's mercy in order to provide the grace of God, in order to show how much God loved us. So the first mission of Jesus, which he has, which is already finished, Jesus shared the love of God, the mercy of God, the compassion of God. But when Jesus comes the second time, please remember, when Jesus comes the second time, Jesus is not going to come as the Prince of Peace. Jesus is not going to come with mercy. Jesus is not going to come with his grace. Jesus is not going to come with anything for us, but he's going to come as the righteous judge. And when he comes as the righteous judge, at that time, Jesus will come to take vengeance against all those who do not believe in him. Please remember, my, my brothers and sisters, when Jesus read the scriptures on that particular day on the Sabbath, on that particular day in Nazareth, he purposely left out this word, the vengeance of our God, only because that time when he came was not to take vengeance of, 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 the, of the Lord, because he has to take that. That scripture is not fulfilled yet. That scripture about God taking vengeance will only be fulfilled at the time of Jesus' second coming. So brothers and sisters, we are now living in the church age of God's mercy and grace. This is the age of the year of jubilee of God's unending love and his unending mercy. That is why he talked about the favor of the Lord, the year that pro pro proclaimed the favor of the Lord, the year of the mercy of God. And every single moment for us on this planet Earth, before we pass out of this life, is a moment of mercy, is a moment for us to receive that grace. But remember, if we are not prepared to receive that mercy and grace, repent and change our lives and start believing in Jesus and believing his word and start bearing the fruit, a time is going to come when we will be finished on this earth and there'll be no more mercy, there'll be no more grace. So the moment of mercy is right now, today, at this very moment. And we must understand that if we are able to appropriate God's mercy and grace, by believing the gospel, by repenting, by changing our thinking, getting away from the world and focusing on the word. Now only we can receive that life of abundance. We can receive the life of God in our day-to-day -day life. Verse number 20. And he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant and sat down. 
the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. You know, Jesus read from Isaiah 61 verses 1 to 2a in such a way that it sounded that he was claiming to be the Messiah as the verses spoke of. Because the verses in Isaiah 61, 1 and 2 actually talked about the Messiah. That was the prophecy that Isaiah had written about the Messiah who would come and on whom was the anointing of the Holy Spirit and he would carry out all those things. So when Jesus was given the scroll on that particular day, he read it in such a way that people began to really wonder, is he the guy? Is he the Messiah? And people did not even have to, nobody actually before had ever talked like this as Jesus has spoken. And they were not even able to digest the fact that this boy from Nazareth who had grown up with them could actually be the Messiah. And as a result, they did not welcome this particular thing of Jesus. They refused to accept him. The people were shocked when they heard that he was the one who was claiming to be the Messiah. And my brothers and sisters, as we begin to see in this verse, what he had said began to catch their attention. And we will see in the next verse that he clearly disclosed to them that he indeed was the Christ. In the verse 21 that we are, we are going to see now, Jesus spoke those verses in Isaiah 61 verses 1 and 2 in such a way that he says, this is fulfilled in your hearing today. Let us read verses 21 and 22 together. Then he began to say to them, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his mouth. They said, is not this Joseph's son? So look at the response of the people when Jesus starts talking about, he says, what I have read today has been fulfilled. And people knew at that time that Isaiah 61 verses 1 and 2 were actually the prophecy of the Messiah. They knew that what Jesus had read only applied to the, to the Messiah. And Jesus had read this passage, which was talking about the prophecy of the, of, the, of the Christ and about the Messiah. And Jesus had read these verses as if he was claiming to be the Christ. And the people whom he grew up with could just not, you know, they began to wonder, did they hear him correctly? Did they hear this, this Jesus who grew up with them in Nazareth really said that he's the Messiah? We know that this man is the son of Mary. He's the son of Joseph. We know that he lived in this neighborhood. How can this man say that the scriptures are fulfilled when we are clear and sure that this is only a prophecy regarding the Messiah? You know, my brothers and sisters, the people of Israel were looking forward to the Messiah to deliver them from the oppression of the Romans. And when they look at Jesus in the temple that day, they begin to wonder, how can this Jesus, who has actually grown up with us, he was, he was raised in this area of Nazareth, now he's claiming to have that title of the Messiah. How can Mary's son, how can this carpenter's son ever become the Messiah? And how can he claim to that? Now, you know, my brothers and sisters, what happened? They rejected the message of Jesus instead of receiving it with great joy and acceptance as, as it should have been. And Luke says, that they were really taken up by the gracious words of Jesus. You know, my brothers and sisters, even though Jesus said that he was the Messiah, he said that these scriptures are fulfilled in your hearing today, yet Jesus, the way he proclaimed it, the way he said it, the way he, he presented it, he presented it with all humility. He presented it as the, serv as the serving servant. And you know, my brothers and sisters, Jesus was indeed the Messiah. Jesus is indeed God. And when he came that day and he told the people, they just did not able to stomach what he had told them. They refused to accept what he had told them and they rejected the good news of Jesus. They rejected him as the Messiah and they failed to receive any good thing from him. You know, my sisters and brothers, many a times God sends people in our life 
There are people sometimes in our neighborhood, there are people in our lives who have grown up with us from our childhood. And there has been a time when they have been away from us, we have lost touch with them, but because they have grown up with us, the images that we have of them, the, the, the things that they did with us, the, day, the things that they did before they knew the Lord, those images seem to remain in our mind. And when those people come, after they have grown in the faith, they have really grown in their knowledge of God, they have really grown in, 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 their, in their journey with Christ. And when they start coming and interacting with us and start speaking to us, we find it's so difficult to digest what they are saying. How can this man, he was a loafer, he was a drunkard, he was taking drugs. How can this man be preaching the word of God? How can we sit and listen to him? I know what his history, I know what he was doing before. And that is why we become so prejudiced. We become so much, you know, prejudiced in our mind when people whom the Lord has touched and the Lord uses for his kingdom and we fail to get the best from God's word because of our prejudices. And you know, my sisters and brothers, the same thing happened with the people of, of Nazareth. Jesus was not a sinful man. Jesus was an exemplary child of Joseph and Mary, but yet he had never performed any miracles there because he had still not been anointed by the Holy Spirit. But after he left Nazareth, he was baptized by John in the river Jordan. He went into the desert for, for 40 days and 40 nights. He, failed, he went through the temptation and then he went straight into Galilee and started his ministry. And this was the first time he comes into his hometown of Nazareth under the influence of the Holy Spirit, under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And the people just have the image of him as they saw him when he left from that place. They cannot stomach the fact that this is the son of God, that this is the chosen one, that this is the Messiah. And therefore they fail to accept him and they reject Jesus. And the word of God says he did not perform any miracles in that place because of their unbelief. Verses 23 to 24. He said to them, doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, doctor, cure yourself. And you will say, do here also in your hometown the things that we have heard you do at Capernaum. And he said, truly, I tell you, no prophet is accepted in the prophet's hometown. You know, they actually quoted a proverb and they said, doctor, cure yourself. In fact, this was the same words the Pharisee and the chief priests has used against Jesus in Matthew chapter 27, verse 42. When Jesus was, um, was, uh, cru was going to be taken for his crucifixion, he was on trial. There was, a, there was you know, a, a mock trial of Jesus. And at the mock trial, the Pharisees actually, on the cross, they go and they start taunting Jesus' these very words. Let us read Matthew 27, verse 42. He saved others. He cannot save himself. He is the king of Israel. Let him come down from the cross now and we will believe in him. What do the people do to him? Jesus is on that cross and the people start, you know, challenging him. Jesus went to the cross not because he did anything wrong. It was the will of the father that Jesus should go to the cross and die for the whole human race because only by his death, he could snatch back that authority which man was given and he had handed over to Satan. So by destroying Jesus on the cross, by touching the son of God, Satan was doing something illegal. Please understand my sisters and brothers, every single person who walks on this earth who does sin, is definitely going to experience the power of Satan, is going to experience the influence of Satan in their life. But Jesus was the sinless son of God. So the moment Satan who was in charge of this world touched the son of God and Jesus died on the cross because of all that assault, now Satan lost that match against Jesus because he did something which was illegal. He did something of touching the son of God whom he couldn't touch who was sinless and had not committed sin. And therefore, brothers and sisters, when those Pharisees and the scribes began to challenge Jesus, come down from the cross and only then we shall believe in you. 
this prophecy which Jesus uttered on that particular day in Nazareth came to pass when those chief priests and the scribes challenged Jesus. And you know, brothers and sisters, the people of, G of, of Nazareth in his hometown were actually challenging Jesus to perform great and mighty miracles. They infected all these miracles that you have done in Galilee, all these miracles that you have done in Capernaum. Please do them here in your own hometown. But you must understand, my dear sisters and brothers, you can't put the Lord to the test. You can't challenge God and expect God to work miracles in your life. In order to perform any, any miracle or in order to receive anything from God, there must be of faith because God will always be moved by faith. And that is why Mark chapter 6 verses 1 to 6, they give us an answer why Jesus was not able to perform any mighty signs and wonders in, in Nazareth or any place where people were without any faith. Let us read Mark chapter 6 verses 1 to 6. He left that place and came to his hometown and his disciples followed him. On the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue and many who heard him were astounded. They said, where did this man get all this? What is this wisdom that has been given to him? What deeds of power are being done by his hands? Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary and brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Then Jesus said to them, Prophets are not without honor, except in their hometown, and among their own kin, and in their own house. And he could, he could not do any deed of power there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and cured them. And he was amazed at their unbelief. So the word of God says in Mark chapter 6 verse 6, that Jesus was amazed at their unbelief. You know, most of the time, my sisters and brothers, people are only praying. Most of the time when you have a situation, somebody is not well, you want a job, you have a problem, you have some issues, people are praying. But are they really praying with the word of God? Are they playing with faith? Are they really believing the word of God? Or are we just praying with hope? praying with fear, hoping that something will happen because we are praying. In fact, I, I remember somebody had passed an acronym and it, the acronym goes like this, PUSH. And you know, the acronym PUSH was pray until something happens. And that is such a, you know, that's, that acronym is so, so far from the truth because you don't pray until something happens. You believe when until you believe, you will never see the glory of God. So people are praying until something happens. And most of the time people pray, pray, pray. And when they don't find an answer to their prayer, they are so disappointed with God. They are so bitter with God. They feel God has been unfair to them. Remember my sisters and brothers, the word of God says in Mark chapter six, verse six, that Jesus was amazed by their unbelief and except by laying a few, his hands on a few people, he did not perform any miracles, any signs and wonders. You know, the truth, my brothers and sisters is, these people were prejudiced toward Jesus. They thought this son of Mary, this son of Joseph, what is he going to do? How can he be the Messiah? And how could they ever think that this man who was with them, who grew with them, could start performing supernatural signs and wonders. How could he start performing all these miracles? And you know, brothers and sisters, the issue was with their prejudices and their unbelief. And as a result, they did not have faith in him and Jesus was not able to show them any signs and wonders, no powers of, of God could be displayed when he went to his hometown of Nazareth. And when we look at this verse, verses 23 and 24, this actually should be a wake up call for each one of us. Many of us are only praying, expecting something to happen. But when we understand that God is only moved when we operate according to his word, when we believe his word, when we have got zero unbelief and we got the faith of a mustard seed. 
And when we have the faith of that mustard seed, the word of God says, Jesus said in Mark 11, 23, if you have the faith of a mustard seed, you could say to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea and it shall obey you. Can you imagine my sisters and brothers, how much can faith help us that believing God in, in God's word help us to receive the supernatural of God, to receive the greatness and the best of God. But the problem is, are we really spending time studying God's word? Are we really spending time believing God's word? Are we really spending time doing what his word says? Or are we only spending time doing some spiritual exercises, praying, fasting, doing lots of things, but never believing it. And you know, if we are going to do it just like Old Testament saying, just praying, fasting, performing all sorts of things, we will be so disappointed because we have still not come to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. We still do not know how the principles of God work, how the kingdom of God works. And when we understand the kingdom of God will always work because of that little mustard faith seed, you and I with zero unbelief, because we are not going to operate based on our five senses. We are going to operate by a sixth sense, which is faith and faith enables us to receive the best of God. That's why in the book of Hebrew, Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6, it says it is impossible to please God without faith. And therefore, if we have faith of the size of a mustard seed, we can receive everything from God, including things which human beings will never be able to achieve. Nothing this world can ever do. When man and God, doctors and every people on this world when they say it is over, it, nothing can be done. Faith can get us such supernatural results when we only believe God's word. First is 25 to 27. 25 to 27. But the truth is, there were many widows in Israel in the time of Elijah when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, and there was a severe famine over all the land. Yet Elijah was sent to none of them, except to a widow at Zarephath in Sidon. There were also many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them was cleansed, except Naaman, the Syrian. So my sisters and brothers, in verses 25 to 27, look at what example Jesus is giving. He gives the example of the widow of Zarephath in Sidon. And this place of Sidon was a Gentile territory. It was not belonging to the territory of Israel. Again, Naman the leper was a Syrian. Again, he was a, he was a Gentile. He was not a person of Israel. Both these people, both these examples that Jesus gave were Gentiles and the Jews despised the Gentiles and thought that God also despised them. Not only did the Jews despise the Gentiles, they also believed that God also despised the Gentiles. And you know, brothers and sisters, Jesus here was clearly telling those people of, of, his, of, his, of his hometown that God did not think as they did. And this angered the Jews so much because Jesus was saying to them that his own people would reject him, but the Gentiles would accept him. Can you imagine? Jesus is coming to his own hometown and he's actually telling those people by giving them these two examples. One is of the, of the widow of Zarephath and one is Naman the leper, a Syrian. And he's telling them these Gentiles, God gave them and ignored all the Jews. And in the same way, if they reject him, God is he's going to go to the Gentiles because Gentiles are going to accept him. And you know, brothers and sisters, the Jews, when they heard this, they were filled with hatred. They were furious at the thought that any Gentile could receive something from God, which they could not get. This was a total arrogance on their part. This was total pride. You know, most of the time, today also, many of us think, that we receive everything because we are Christians. We have been baptized. This could go actually far from the truth. We are not receiving from God because we are baptized. We receive from God only because we believe. If we believe the word of God, then only we can receive everything from God. You know, my sisters and brothers, 
I have gone to different places and I've seen that in during the times when, when, I, when I go to share the word in that congregation, there are people who don't even know, know Christ. They don't even know Christ because they've never been baptized. They've never been born in a Christian family. But when they come there, they begin to hear the word of God. They begin to believe the word of God and they begin to experience the power of the word of God. They receive healing. There are miracles. There are signs. I remember one time I've been out of the country and I remember I was in that place and there was a woman who was, was actually not a, she was a Buddhist and absolutely never heard about Christ. But the day she began to listen to the word of God, she began to understand what the word of God is. That particular person got up from the wheelchair, started walking, and then even her niece who was there present, who did not even accept, believe even in Buddhism or any other religion, accepted Christ and made Christ her Lord, God, and Savior. You know, my sisters and brothers, when we begin to think just like those Jews, just because we are baptized, just because we go to church, just because we go to Sunday mass, just because we pray, we are saved and we are going to get the best of God. That is far from the truth. The reason when somebody can receive from God is only by believing the good news, believing his word. And when we believe his word, we shall see God's very best in our life. We shall see great signs and wonders. And therefore, brothers and sisters, it is important for us to understand that just like the Jews, we should humble up. We should just like those Jews, we should not be like them. We should not be arrogant. We should not be so proud. Look down upon people of other religions, of other faiths. But let us be an example to them. Let us share with to them our own testimonies. How God has been good to us. How we are experiencing victory in our life. How we experience miracles in our life. How we experience God's goodness in our life. And when we can share with people who don't know Christ, by our own testimonies, we can bring those people to the Lord and we can also allow them to experience that same life that you and I can also receive from the Lord Jesus Christ. Verses 28 and 29. When they heard this, all in the synagogue were filled with rage. They got up, drove him out of the town and led him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built so that they might hurl him off the cliff. The main reason why the Jews were angry with Jesus, why they were so furious at Jesus was because Jesus had given them these two references when God overlooked the Jews and brought healing and deliverance to the Gentiles. Remember my sisters and brothers, this story that we heard of Naman the leper and about the widow at Zarephath, they were both Gentile people. They did not belong to the covenant that God had with the Jews. And here Jesus was telling the Jews of his own hometown that God had overlooked the Jews because they were unbelievers. They had not believed. They had so much of unbelief, although they had the covenant. What happened to the, to the, to the army of Israel when they faced Goliath? We saw that about, two, about a week ago or the story of David and Goliath. The people of Israel had a covenant with God and when they were weak, God would always show up. But what happened to those to this Israel army, the army of the living God? They began to shiver. They began to have fear until a shepherd boy, David, understood his covenant with the Lord. And he began to say, who is this uncircumcised Philistine who is challenging the army of the living God? And that is why David, who understood he, who he was and what covenant he had, went and challenged Goliath and defeated a giant, although he had no experience in fighting in the army. And today, my sisters and brothers, when you and I can understand God's word, when we can believe God's word, we also, like David, can defeat and destroy every Goliath in our life, everything that comes against us. But we must have the sword of the spirit with us. We must know God's word. We must have an understanding of the word of God. And only then we can receive God's very best. So those people did not understand the word. They did not understand their covenant. And they thought Jesus was of the devil because he said that he will go to the Gentiles. And so they thought that they were the chosen people of God and God, and he was going to bypass them and go to the Gentiles. And the Gentiles would benefit because he was going to bypass them. And you know, brothers and sisters, on that particular day in Nazareth in the synagogue, it is possible 
that when Jesus was saying all these things, Mary, his mother was there, his brothers were there, all his family members were there, and they would never have ever imagined that there would be an attempted murder of Jesus. Can you imagine when Jesus says all those things that there was nobody from Israel who benefited during the time of the famine or there was only a Gentile woman and there was Naman the leper. They actually pick up Jesus and take him up on the top of a cliff to throw him down. But the word of God says Jesus did not get through that. Jesus escaped it. And you know, my sisters and brothers, when Jesus' brothers and Mary must have seen all that commotion taking place, what could have been going through in their mind? What could have been going on into the minds of the brothers of Jesus? In fact, the word of God says in John chapter 7, verse 15, 1 to 5, John chapter 7, verses 1 to 5, that Jesus' brothers did not believe in him. This particular morning, when Jesus actually started talking to them and the people got angry with them, this was the point where it was a seed was sown where they failed to believe in Jesus. Can you imagine? His own family members did not accept him as the Lord God and Savior. Let us see John chapter 7 verses 1 to 5 to see how his own brothers whom he grew up with did not believe in his own son, believe in his own brother Jesus. Let's read that. After Jesus went about in Galilee, he did not wish to go about in Judea because the Jews were looking for an opportunity to kill him. Now the Jewish festival of booths was near. So his brother said to him, leave here and go to Judea so that your disciples also may see the works you are doing. For no one who wants to be widely known acts in secret. If you do these things, show yourself to the world, for not even his brothers believed in him. Not even his brothers believed in him. They knew that the Jews were after him. They knew that the Jews wanted to take the life of Jesus. And instead of protecting him, instead of encouraging him, instead of you know glorifying God for what their brother was doing, they were actually challenging Jesus. They said, go there and do whatever you are going to do because you can't be staying on, on, in the secret. You must understand my sisters and brothers. Jesus did not fear death. Jesus had no issues about doing the will of his father, but he needed at the same time some encouragement from his brothers. He needed some encouragement from his own family, but he received none of it because the word of God says not even his brothers believed in him. And you know, my sisters and brothers, one of the signs or one of the reasons why we fail today to receive God's very best is when we are so prejudiced, as I mentioned earlier, we are so prejudiced to people who live in our own hometown, maybe our own pastor, our own priest of our parish, or maybe, you know, people who, who we know what we have grown up with, when they begin to share God's word, we begin to look at what we know about them in the past. We begin to say, oh, isn't he the son of this particular family? Don't, wasn't his father a drunkard? Wasn't his father a baker? Wasn't his, wasn't his mother a cook? And we begin to have all sorts of prejudices in our mind, but we fail to hear the message that the man of God is going to preach us. And today, as we reflect on this particular thing, the people of Nazareth did the same thing to Jesus. They rejected the son of God. They rejected the Messiah because of their prejudices. They failed to receive God's very best. And the word of God says, Jesus did not perform any signs and wonders. In fact, they went out of their way, picked Jesus up, took him up the cliff with an intention of killing him and murdering him on that particular day. But the word of God says, in verse number 30, that he escaped from that crowd. Let us read verse number 30. But he passed through the midst of them and went on his way. Jesus passed through them and went on his way. Jesus exhibited, my dear sisters and brothers, a supernatural ability to walk right through this mob that was trying to murder him, that was trying to kill him. And you know, my dear sisters, this particular incident helps us to understand that we also can have supernatural protection in our life 
You know, in John chapter 10, verse 18, Jesus had said that no one can take his own life. That's what Jesus said in John chapter 10, verse 18. Let us read that. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have the power to lay it down and I have the power to take it up again. I have received this command from my father. So here Jesus was talking about his own life. He was saying that nobody can take his life away. Nobody can touch him because he's the one who will willingly give his life. Nobody has the power to take his life. And you know, my sisters and brothers, that brings us to a very important truth. When we understand that we are in the center of God's will, when we are doing the will of God, we also can appropriate, we also can receive supernatural protection from the Lord. We must understand in order to do have supernatural protection of the Lord, we must be in the center of God's will. We must be living a life which is according to God's will. Because if we do something or we are living a life against God's will, we are doing our own thing the thief is definitely going to come and kill, steal, and destroy. But when we are in the center of God's will, we have what is called a supernatural protection. Angels are around us. That's what Psalm 91 says. He has put his angels in charge of us. And when we know that we are doing what God has called us to do, we can also receive supernatural protection. That is why, brothers and sisters, people of God, there were great men and women of God, even though they knew that they had supernatural protection of, law, of the Lord, they refused to accept this protection because they wanted to live the higher life with God. That's what it says in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 35. Let us read how great men and women of God did not take the supernatural protection because they wanted to die and go to be with the Lord because they were sure that they had already finished their assignment here. They did not want to live any longer on this earth, but wanted to live that higher life, that new resurrected life. Let us read Hebrews 11 verse 35. Women received their dead by resurrection. Others were tortured, refusing to accept release in order to obtain a better resurrection. So those people wanted to attain a better resurrection. And you know, my sisters and brothers, as long as we are in the center of God's will, unless we are doing what God has called us to do, there is going to be no protection. But the moment we are doing God's will, we are in the center of God's will. When we are doing what God has called us to do, the word of God says, just like what Jesus, he walked right through that mob. He walked right out of trouble. He was going to be thrown over the cliff and he was going to be murdered. But supernaturally, he was able to walk out from that mob and nobody could touch him because his hour had not come. And in the same way, my sisters and brothers, today the good news is for us, for us to repent, for us to be in the center of God's will, to do what God's will says. That's what St. Paul wrote in the book of uh, uh, Romans chapter 12, verse 1. He says, do not be conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you will know what is that which is good, acceptable, and the perfect will of God. Let us, let us end today's class by reading together Romans chapter 12, verse 1. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 talks about how we can do the will of God, how we can truly receive that supernatural protection of the Lord by being in the center of God's will. Let us read Romans chapter 12, verse 1. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Verse, verse 2. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds, so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. What is that good acceptable and perfect and how we can discern the will of God. So brothers and sisters, when we do not conform ourselves to this world, but we are conforming ourselves to the word of God, 
surely we are in the center of God's will. We are doing, we are discerning God's will and we are doing what is perfect before the Lord. And so today, as we reflect on today's gospel, it's not about Jesus going to Nazareth, preaching the word of God, people rejecting him and we all reading it. But let us apply that same thing to us today. If we are not going to be like the people of Nazareth, if we are going to be people of faith, we are going to do what the Lord has called us to do. We are going to be in the center of God's will. Let us not be conformed to this world, but let us be transformed by the renewing of our mind so that we will discern the will of God and do what is perfect, what is good, and what is just before the Lord. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you and we praise you for the understanding of your word today. You said, Lord, to the people of Nazareth, that unless they were ready to accept him, they were ready to believe in him, they would never be able to see his glory. And indeed, the people of Nazareth did not see your glory, Lord, because they were governed by their prejudices. They were governed by unbelief. Today, Lord, as the word has been preached to us, you have spoken the word. Help us not only to be hearers of the word, but help us to be doers of the word. Help us to repent, to change our thinking, not to be conformed to this world, but to be transformed by the renewing of our mind based on your word. And help us to discern your will, to experience heaven here on earth by doing what your word says and fulfilling our mission, which you have called each one of us to do. We thank you and praise you, Father, for this great privilege and this understanding. In the glorious name of Jesus, amen.